All right, I think we can, be can begin. Let's begin with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for this wonderful community of which we are a part, for Good Shepherd, for the people gathered around this table. We pray that we would be open and aware and attentive of your spirit among us, speaking to us, teaching us, leading us, guiding us, loving us. We pray for this Bible study as we learn about passages of scripture, about first and second Maccabees, about the story of Hanukkah, that as we learn the history, we also uh, might learn something about our own selves and the way we live our own lives. We pray also for Roger, and for Janice, and for all those who are going through times of challenge in health and in other ways, that you would bring peace and healing to them. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So we always start with our names. So I'm Derek. I'm Mary. Perfect. Thank you. So for the next four weeks, today's the first out of four, we're, we're looking at first and second Maccabees. Um, these two books from the Apocrypha, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that is. And the reason we picked that for this time of year in December is because this is where the story of Hanukkah comes from. Uh, and of course, we don't celebrate Hanukkah in the Christian tradition, but it's our Jewish siblings. They celebrate Hanukkah uh, normally in December. It fluctuates depending on the Hebrew calendar. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit about what Maccabees is and where this story comes from. I want to start, though, with a reading of scripture that's not from the book of Maccabees, but one that's more familiar to us, the gospel according to John, chapter 10. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Is this passage Sound familiar to anyone? Yeah? You notice, though, in the very first verse, at that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. You know anything about that festival? It's Hanukkah. It's Hanukkah. The festival of the dedication, right there in John chapter 10, verse 22. And so while Hanukkah might not be a celebration that Christians observe, it's a celebration that Jesus was observing, that he was at the temple because, on that day because of Hanukkah. The word Hanukkah means uh, uh, dedication. I believe it's dedication or is it purification? It's dedication. Um, so dedication of the temple. So we're talking about Hanukkah and I just want to put out there right away that I'm not Jewish. I've never celebrated Hanukkah before. So uh, we can talk about Hanukkah, but don't take my word on it for every way we celebrate Hanukkah. I'm, I'm not Jewish. I'm also not a historian and I'm not an expert in first and second Maccabees. One of the reasons I wanted to look at this is because I myself wanted to study more about Maccabees. And so we're all kind of learning together and I hope I don't say anything too off base um, but as a, you know, someone that has studied scripture and has studied spirituality and religion, um, you know, I'll, I'll come to it from that perspective and share what I've studied um, as we study together. So first, what is Hanukkah? Hanukkah is the eight-day Jewish festival of lights, beginning on the 25th day of the Hebrew month of Kislev, which is usually in December. It fluctuates. Sometimes it's earlier, sometimes it's later. The Hebrew calendar um, is based on the lunar calendar, 
And so it, it does fluctuate just like Easter for us fluctuates quite a bit, depending on when the full moon after the spring solstice, I think is, is it spring or equinox? The spring equinox. And, uh, and so, it, but normally it takes place in December and it's easy to remember the 25th day of Kislev, our, Jewish, our, our Christian holiday of Christmas is on the 25th day of December. So there's a similarity there. Hanukkah commemorates the rededication of the temple, the second temple in 165 BCE after the victory of Judas Maccabeus against the king or the emperor Antiochus Epiphanes. We'll get into the history in just a little bit. But it, it like I said, Hanukkah means uh, dedication or a feast of the dedication. So um, Antiochus Epiphanes had the temple and had Jerusalem. Judas Maccabeus came in and fought back and won the victory. And the day they rededicated the temple is the day they call the feast of the dedication or now Hanukkah. Uh, Hanukkah features the lighting of the menorah, which is probably familiar to you. It has nine candles on it. One of the candles, the I believe the middle one, is meant to be the lighting candle where you get the fire from. And then you light, and then the other eight candles represent the eight days of Hanukkah. And that was a tradition that we see in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, that when the temple was dedicated, there were... Uh, eight days of celebration. And so they had the candles lit for eight days. And so there's one candle for each day of Hanukkah uh, celebrating that rededication. Uh, it, it Also, the, the, the lighting of the candles symbolizes that the legend, legend says that that first Hanukkah, there was only enough oil to light one candle. And yet miraculously, it was lit for eight days. It lasted for eight days. What we're going to find is that's not actually in First and Second Maccabees, but that is the legend that has gone along with it and what they celebrate today. You'll be, you might be surprised to know that Hanukkah is not a very big holiday in the Jewish tradition. It's not a major feast day. Um, it's not, you know, it's not in the Bible uh, for Jews, at least. And so it's not a major feast day. It is a celebration. It's one that Jesus celebrated and that Jews celebrate, but it wasn't a big deal. However, it's becoming more of a big deal in the United States because it's a great Jewish alternative to Christmas. And Christmas is such a big cultural moment in our society um, that a, a lots of other religions are kind of emphasizing their minor ho holidays that show up in that area uh, so that they can also participate in all of the festivities. So that's why more and more commercialism, like the stores sell menorahs and, and have different things like that um, because of the influence of Christmas in our society. So this year, Hanukkah is from December 18th to December 26th. December 18th through December 26th. And so it does cross over the Christmas period for us by a couple of days. Christmas, of course, begins December 25th in the Christian calendar, but it lasts 12 days all the way to January 6th. So the format of this class is we're going to read through selected portions of First and Second Maccabees. These two books have 15, 16 chapters each, and it's too much for us to read all together. Now you can read it on your own. You're happy to, um, I can, I can uh, help recommend where you can read it, but we're gonna take portions of it and focus primarily on the story of Hanukkah leading up to the rededication of the temple. So first Maccabees extends much longer than that, um, long after the dedication of the temple and what happens after that, but we're gonna focus on just that beginning part. Second Maccabees, focuses on pretty much just the dedication of the temple and Judas Maccabeus, the main figure. Um, but it's a lot more detailed and a lot more theological in orientation. We'll talk about that. So I have, I'm going to pass out to you now, um, a handout. You can take one and pass it around. 
and there are 11 readings and each reading has some discussion questions. And so we'll come together, we'll read the passage and then we'll talk about it. We, we may or may not use the discussion questions, but they're there to help us kind of continue on that. Uh, today is, is mostly going to be an introduction though to Maccabees. And so hopefully we'll get to the first and second reading today, but for now, we're not gonna uh, use this. First, we're gonna talk more about what Maccabees is and, and kind of give an introduction. But then as you see, this is the schedule for the rest of our time. Next week, December 7th, readings three through five, December 14th, reading six through eight, and then December 21st, which is in Hanukkah, readings nine through 11. Uh, hopefully, I'd like to do reading the first and second reading today. So that's page two and three. And next week, beginning with the third reading. Um, but we'll just see how much time we have. This schedule might be a little flexible. If we don't get to some or we move a little quicker than we thought, then we'll go through that. But yeah. So first a question, why should we study first and second Maccabees? There, I've got some answers here, but first, why are you here? Some of you are here because you come to Bible study no matter what. <laughs> but are you interested in Maccabees? What, why are you here? Why would you want to study first and second Maccabees? Anybody? Oh, uh, well, my children are um, a quarter Jewish, and I'm like, I don't even know anything about this. So okay. I heard you in church say, oh my gosh. Well, we'll get this. Okay. Oh. Okay, cool. Um, and my daughter is very interested. Yeah. My... Yeah. So there's sort of a personal connection there. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. About what that is. Yeah. Eleanor? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here are my reasons. <laughs> it's Maccabees, first and second Maccabees are interesting, but often neglected books regarded by many as scripture, although not everyone considers them scripture. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But I find that they are very interesting and for the same reason as some of you say, you know, we don't know a lot, we don't hear a lot about it. Maccabees is not actually in our lectionary. We don't ever read lex uh, Maccabees on Sunday, but we do read other parts of the Apocrypha um, on Sundays and funerals and other places. Um, so it's helpful to know about the apocryphal tradition. I think it help, It also gives us a better understanding of the world just before Jesus. So this takes place in the second century BCE, it takes place about 150, 160 years before Jesus was born. And that gives us a window into the culture and the political uh, circumstances that Jesus was born into. It teaches us about the history of Hanukkah, and that's a, a step for us uh, a sh a towards a shared understanding with our Jewish siblings. We could always be doing a better job of, of uh, understanding our Jewish siblings more and connecting with them more. And if we know the story of Hanukkah, that's a, person, that's a connection there. And also because it poses interesting questions for reflection on themes such as religious fundamentalism, tolerance, conformity, religious persecution, all themes that are very relevant for our own world today. I will just say ahead of time that uh, the stories of First and Second Maccabees are not particularly um, heartwarming. They, they are heavy topics. They're about <laughs> battle. They're about war. They're about religious persecution. Uh, and sometimes we'd like to not talk about those things, 
But I think those things are relevant to our lives, relevant to the world around us. And so by looking at Maccabees, maybe we can uh, think more deeply about those things for our own context, even though they are completely different contexts. What are the Book of Maccabees? Well, they are two or four books of the Apocrypha. So there's first Maccabees. This is an abbreviated history from the rise of someone named Mattathias through the high priesthood of three of his sons, Judas, Jonathan, and Simon. Second Maccabees is a theological history of the victories of just that first son, Judas Maccabees or Judas Maccabeus. Uh, first Maccabees is very much a historical book. It tells you what happened and it tells it to you pretty quickly. It moves very quickly, about 15 or 16 chapters. Second Maccabees spends a lot more time reflecting theologically about what was happening uh, for the victories of Judas Maccabees. And we're going to be reading from portions of 1st Maccabees and 2nd Maccabees. So we'll be able to see those differences. Then there's 3rd Maccabees, which is not in the Anglican or the Roman Catholic Bible. So if you have a Bible that has the Apocrypha in it, you probably will not find 3rd Maccabees. Um, and it's completely unrelated to the story of the Maccabean revolt. It is instead about the Jewish diaspora in Egypt and the persecutions they faced there in Egypt. And it just happens to be called Maccabees for convenience for some. Third Maccabees uh, is in some Christian scriptures, but not in the Western tradition, not in Anglican, Protestant, or Roman Catholic traditions. And then there's 4th Maccabees, which is also not in Anglican or Roman Catholic Bible. I don't think it's even in the Orthodox Bible. 3rd Maccabees is in the Eastern Orthodox Bible. Um, and again, it is completely unrelated to the Maccabean Revolt. And it is more of a wisdom book. It's, uh, it's a philosophical treaty on the importance of reason. So you might hear, or you might pick up an Apocrypha that has four books of Maccabees. That one has all four. Um, is it, is that just a, exactly. So that's a, a specifically an Apocrypha. And in fact, if I recommend an Apocrypha to you, you can find it all online, but that's the one I'd recommend. And that's the one I'm reading from the new Oxford annotated Apocrypha. And what's so great about that one is it has a commentary all along the way and in introductions to the books. So you can learn a lot from the new Oxford uh, annotated Apocrypha. Um, but that is not a Bible, that's an Apocrypha. And so if you buy a book that's just the Apocrypha, you'll get a lot more books, including probably all four books of Maccabees. But if you buy a Bible that has the Apocrypha, like the Roman Catholic Bible, then you're not going to get all four, you're just going to get the two. And for our purposes, that's okay, because we're only looking at first and second Maccabees, because they're the only ones that are related to the Maccabean revolt. Um, so I haven't even read third and fourth Maccabees myself, uh, so I can't speak to a lot of, about them. Does it? The Bible has third and fourth Maccabees? Oh. New Oxford Annotated Bible with the Apocrypha. Okay. I stand corrected. Is it in it's yours, really Joan? It, just, really? Yeah. As an apocryphal, is that the Oh, really? So that's so that leads us to the next question: What is the apocrypha, and why are there conflicting accounts of what's in the apocrypha, what's not in the apocrypha? When do we use the apocrypha? When do we not? Who uses it? Who? The question has to do with. Uh, canonicity. Uh, what do we call books of the Bible? What do we call the Bible? Uh, normally, you go to the store, you pick up a Bible, and you don't think much about it. But for centuries, you know, the Bible is not just a book. It's a collection of books. And through the centuries, Christians have had to decide 
what books are canonical, meaning sacred and considered to be primary texts, the Bible, and what books are not. And if a book is not canonical, if it's not a sacred book of scripture, is it, st is it useless or is it still helpful? It doesn't mean that it's bad necessarily, but maybe it's just, you know, like you would read C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. That's not scripture, but that's a sacred, that's a book about sacred things that we can learn from, right? So are there books that are not in the Bible that don't hold sacred status, but are still valuable to us? That's the question. And through the centuries, Christians have had different beliefs about that. And so a lot of Christians don't realize that even to this day, there are debates about what books should be in the Bible. In the United States, where the Protestant tradition is the strongest, it, we, we don't have any question. There's 66 books in the Bible. That's the way that it's been. But in Syria, in Russia, in Egypt, in the Middle East, there are entire different books of the Bible that are in there. And a lot of them are what we call the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha are a collection of books that are included in the Greek Old Testament, what we call the Septuagint, and in Latin translations of the Old Testament, but they're not included in the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew canon, and thus they're not included in the Protestant Old Testament. So this gets really confusing, but most of the Old Testament was written, written in Hebrew, but it was translated very early on into Greek. In fact, the manuscripts that we have, the oldest ones we have are in Greek. Now we have manuscripts of the, the Old Testament that are in Hebrew, but the ones we have, even though the original language is Hebrew, the ones we have are not as old as the manuscripts we have that are in Greek. And so from the very beginning, Greek played an important role. Now, as we're determining what books are in the Bible, the Christians were answering that question at the same time as many of the Jews were answering that question. And of course, they were separate conversations. And so the Jews decided what books were going to be in the Bible. They were mostly the same Old Testament books that the Christians used, although they put them in a completely different order. So if you open up a Hebrew Bible today, you'll recognize all the books of the Bible, but they're in a different order than in our Christian Bible. And they only included the books that they had in Hebrew. So all of the books that are in the Apocrypha, uh, they did not include because they were not, they were, there were no record of them in Hebrew. They were only Greek books. Whereas the Christians decided to read them and to include them. And so early on, the Christians counted the Apocrypha as scripture. Although even from the earliest times, there was debate about how scriptural they were. They were almost like second class scripture for some people. Like uh, the person that translated the Bible into Latin, Jerome, um, or Jeremy, depending on how you pronounce his name, he wasn't so sure about the Apocrypha. He included it in the Bible and then said, but maybe they're not as useful as you think. I'll leave it up to you. That, that's, that's what he said in the fifth century, I think, sixth century. Um, so Christians included the Apocrypha in the Bible. Jews did not include the Apocrypha in the Bible. Then in the Protestant Reformation, there came this battle cry, sola scriptura, uh, scripture only. Scripture has the authority over all things, where before it had been, you know, Christian tradition, Christian hierarchy. Scripture is important, but that comes from the tradition and hierarchy. And so because the Protestants said the Bible is the ultimate authority, they had to determine, well, what is the Bible? What do we determine the Bible is? And so early on in the 16th century with the Protestant Reformation, the Protestants said the Apocrypha are not in the Bible. We're going to follow the line of the Hebrew Bible, the Jews, and what they've included. And so now what we have is the Protestants 
have their Bible of 66 books and they do not read or include the Apocrypha. They're probably even suspicious of the Apocrypha. Whereas uh, Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox folks, they do include the Apocrypha and they have, you know, after the Protestant Reformation, they had um, uh, official documents written to say, no, the Apocrypha is part of scripture. And so are the Apocrypha part of scripture? That that's, depends on if you're Protestant or not Protestant. Now, us in the uh, Anglican church, are we Protestant or are we Catholic? We are Protestant, but we have always tried to be a middle way, a via media, and we are deeply influenced by the Catholic tradition. And so that's why, you know, Catholics come to our church all the time and they say, oh, this is very familiar. I recognize this, right? Um, and so we are the via media. And, uh, and that comes from the tradition of our own Protestant Reformation in England, where half the country wanted to be Roman Catholic and half the country wanted to be Protestant. And so they cut the difference in so many ways. And, um, and we find influences of both traditions in, in our tradition. We are definitely Protestant. And the farther back you go in the history of the Anglican church, the more Protestant it is. But with time, over time, Catholicism has kind of seeped back into it. So what does that mean? Um, for us, in the 39 articles, um, which were published in 1571 by the Church of England, which you can find in the back of your Book of Common Prayer, we still have them, the 39 articles, uh, there's a list, and it identifies what books are in the Bible. Right there in the Book of Common Prayer, you may not have seen it, but in your prayer book, you open up to the back, and it tells you what books of the Bible we believe in, and it lists 66 books of the Bible commonly accepted by Protestants, just the 66. But then there's a sentence that says, and the other books, as Jerome has said, the Apocrypha, the church reads for example of life and instruction of manners, but does not apply them to establish any doctrine such as these following. And then it lists 14 more books, the ones recognized by Roman Catholics uh, as scripture. So Anglicans read the Apocrypha. We read them as scripture, but not quite to the same level as the 66 books that Protestants read. We cut the difference and said, we put them in our Bible, we read them, but we're not going to base our doctrine off of them. So kind of a compromise there. Uh, so uh, when you're looking for an Apocrypha, if you find an NRSV translation of the Bible, New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, you can often find that an Apocrypha has it. That's the tradition. That's the translation you'll find most often in the Episcopal Church. You can also, I also recommend to you, like I said, the New Oxford Annotated Apocrypha. It's a great one, which you have as well, basically. Ecumenical study, Bible. Oh, ecumenical study Bible. Um, so yeah, again, the, the Eastern Orthodox, they have even more. They like they have Third Maccabees, for example, where the Roman Catholics don't. So that's another reason why. Exactly, exactly. And uh, you can also find the Apocrypha on online, especially in places like Bible Gateway, BibleGateway.com. I don't know if you've ever been there, but if you're ever looking for a passage of scripture, go to BibleGateway.com and you can type in any word, any phrase, any reference, scripture reference, John 10, 22, and it'll pop up for you. And they also have the Apocrypha in there. So if you're looking for Maccabees, you can type first Maccabees in BibleGateway.com and it'll pop right up for you and you can read as much of it as you want. Uh, used to say everyone should have read the Bible. Ah, yeah. Well-read Bible. Clever. Clever. 
Any questions about the Apocrypha? When you say it's not in the Hebrew canon, does that mean it's not the, the Hebrew? I mean, the Jews do not have Maccabees in their Bible? That's right. Well, it's a historical document. And the rabbis, um, of course, would read from it and, and celebrated it. Um, but, but not everything that comes from theological or liturgical tradition in the Christian or the Jewish traditions come from the Bible. And so this is an example where it is not in their Bible at all, but the, they still celebrate it um, because it comes from historical tradition and from historical texts. So, uh, you know, we celebrate, um, what do we celebrate? Uh, like uh, the feast day of St. Francis. That's not in the Bible, but we celebrate it because it's part of our history, part of our, our tradition. Um, but it is a little confusing, isn't it? I mean, there's lots, of, it's complex. It, there's a complicated answer to the question. So looking back at Maccabees, who are the main figures, people in first and second Maccabees? Uh, the, the main ones are Mattathias and his five sons, especially Judas called Maccabeus. So we have uh, Mattathias and his five sons, John Gaddy, Simon called Thassi, Judas called Maccabees, Maccabeus, Eleazar called Averon, and Jonathan called Aphis. And these are really nicknames. It was common in uh, those days in the Middle East to have multiple names, two names, uh, sometimes a name in Hebrew, sometimes a name in Greek, like Simon and Peter, um, or, or others like that. Sometimes one Hebrew name and then a nickname which is the case for Judas. So Judas, son of Mattathias, was called Maccabeus, which means, anyone know what Maccabeus means? The hammer. So that was, when we say Maccabees, we are referring to the nickname of Judas, this warlord, basically, um, who everyone called the hammer. Uh, that's where that name comes from. Music, and what is that? So, Handel, who wrote the Messiah, uh huh, which a lot of the scripture, yeah, he also wrote an oratorio called Judas Maccabeus. Oh, really? I don't know any music from it, but it's just like, uh -huh. I have to look that up. I need to look that up. I didn't know that. Then we have King Antiochus Epiphanes, he is, um. A king of, I think, the Syrian, the Syrians to the north. It's really complicated. When you read First Maccabees, um, the, the uh, area of Israel is over, you know, the, Babel, the Babylonians have it, and then the Persians have it, and then the Syrians have it, and then Egypt has it. And then the Syrians have it again, and then the Romans have it, then the Greeks have it, and then it's always under leadership change. And one of those kings from the north was King Antiochus Epiphanes, and we'll hear more about him. He's sort of the bad guy of the story. Then we have the Hellenized Jews. Uh, the first Maccabees calls them the renegades, and we'll talk more about that. But these are Jews that adopted the Greek culture that was kind of flowing into um, that area. So Greek language, Greek ideas, even Greek religion at times, those were the Hellenized Jews. Then we have the traditionalist Jews, those that stuck to the tradition of the, the Jewish laws and the Bible. And then we have the Gentiles or the Greeks, those non-Jews who lived in the area. So that's sort of an introduction, and I want to go ahead and move to our first reading and then our second reading. Our second reading will give us more of a historical context, and the first reading gives you a flavor of the, the kind of reading uh, Second Maccabees is. Second Maccabees is a letter that was written from the Jews in Jerusalem or Israel to uh, 
kindred Jews living in Egypt. So remember, historically, <clears throat> Israel was a country that was self-ruled, but then the Assyrians came and conquered the northern part of the empire. And then the Babylonians came and conquered the southern part of the empire. And when they did that, they captured a lot of Jewish families and, and sent them to other places. And that was a technique that a lot of empires did to try to, to try to make a new people. If they kept the people where they were, then they had to stick to their own traditions. But if they exiled them, took them to another place, then they had, those people had to learn the culture of that new place, and especially their children. I mean, we see this in immigrant families and immigrate, you know, uh, immigrants come and then their children are a little bit less of the culture that came before, and those children are a little bit less. So it was a way of kind of erasing one culture and living into another culture. So the Babylonians did that. But then the Persians took over the Babylonians, and then the Greeks took over the Persians, and they were continually moving people around. Some Jews got to go back to Israel, but some Jews didn't. And so by this period of time, there are Jews living all around the world. There are Jews living in Egypt. There are Jews living in Babylon, Jews living up in Syria and in Antioch, and even in the West. Um, Jews living all around. And those are Jews that maybe decided not to come back to Israel. And they're still and they're still Jewish, and they and maybe they still celebrate the Jewish traditions, uh, but they are the Jewish diaspora. And even today, we talk about the Jewish diaspora, Jews living all around the world. Um, and so there was a large population of Jews living in Egypt. And Second Maccabees is a letter written to the Jews living in Egypt. Would someone like to read for us the first? Uh, paragraph. Yeah, first reading, 2 Maccabees chapter 1 and selected portions of chapter 2. Can you read just the, before that too, the Jews? Thank you. So that word purification is another word for dedication. And, that, and so they're talking here, we're celebrating the purification. We're celebrating Hanukkah. We're celebrating what happened uh, when Judas Maccabeus um, rededicated the temple and recaptured Jerusalem. It went everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and yet there's still this prayer here. We have hope in God that he will soon have mercy on us and will gather us from everywhere under heaven into his holy place. The, the modern nation state uh, of Israel, the modern country of Israel, you know, was only founded in 1948. Um, the history of Israel is a complicated history. So when we talk about Israel today, it's not the same Israel that we were talking about in ancient times. Um, but because of this ancient history and this ancient hope that the Jews will again be gathered out of diaspora into the land of Israel, that's the inspiration behind the Zionist movements that gave way to the, the modern nation of Israel founded in 1948. Uh, and so some Jews uh, still are praying this prayer 
that, that all Jews will be gathered into Israel. Uh, can someone read for us the second paragraph? Thank you. And further, the wars against Antipas and Tiffany and his son named Sure. <laughs> and the appearances that came from heaven to those who fought bravely for Judaism, so that though few in number, they seized the whole land that pursued the barbarian Jews, and who gained possession of the people famous throughout the world, and liberated the city and reestablished. Oh, yeah. oh, you skipped a little. Reestablish the laws. Thank you. So lots of run-on sentences in that paragraph. Um, but basically he's saying there's this five-volume history written by Jason of Cyrene all about these stories, but that's uh, pretty dense and long for most of us. And so we're going to rewrite the story for you so that you might know it um, and be able to memorize it. Uh, you can see how important it is to those writing this letter to those in Egypt. They want, even though the Jews in Egypt are not in Israel and are not at the temple, they want them to know what happened there um, at the temple. And they hear at the beginning, they call it the greatest temple, the purification of the greatest temple, because there were other temples of other religions, right? And that was the big question. Um, but our temple is the greatest temple and the dedication of the altar. Can someone read that last paragraph? Nevertheless, to secure the gratitude of many, we will grant, gladly endure the uncomfortable toil, leaving the responsibility for exact details to the compiler while devoting our efforts to arriving at the outlines of the compensation. For as the master builder of a new house must be concerned with the whole construction, while the one who undertakes its painting and decoration has to consider only what is suitable for its adornment, such, is my, such in my judgment is the case with us. It is the duty of the original historian to occupy the ground, to discuss the matters from every side, and to take trouble with details. But the one who recasts the narrative should be allowed to strive for brevity of expression and to forgo exhaustive treatment. At this point, therefore, let us begin our narrative without adding any more to what has already been said, for it would be foolish to lengthen the preface while cutting short the history itself. Isn't that interesting? I know. This is... What's your impressions of this? I love the analysis. Yeah, it's such insight into who's writing this. You know, yeah. this is such a new word. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 It, it, <laughs> translation. The translation, but but the ideas. I mean, those are the original yeah. ideas. Second Maccabees is um, is a paradox because uh, the whole story of Maccabees is about maintaining the tradition of the Jewish people over and against the creeping Greek culture. 
So you can almost imagine, again, the story of an immigrant or the story of intercultural folks where the parents say, this is our way. You know, you can see Fiddler on the Roof. Tradition, tradition, <laughs> right? Um, it's all about tradition and the importance of tradition in the midst of a, a, a secular or an, another culture making its way in. But Maccabees, Second Maccabees, is a fusion of cultures. It was written in Greek, not in Hebrew. And the style of writing is Greek. You can kind of see the way they write. This doesn't quite sound like other passages of scripture in the Bible, does it? No, it's written in the Greek style. And yet the content of it is advocating for the rich Hebrew tradition. And so it's, it's, it, it itself is a fusion of cultures and stands sort of as a paradox. And you say, I'm getting the weeds yeah. about this story. Yeah. So to cut it short, we're going to give you the main points. The historian has already done all of that. Done all of it. Yeah. Now, and, I, and that's why there's five books, I guess. Yeah. Right, five, not just books, but volumes, it says, <laughs> five volumes, which is extensive. Now, unfortunately, those are lost to history. We don't, we don't have those. We, we have no idea what they say. And second, the second Maccabees doesn't seem to be aware of the existence of first Maccabees. And we think, we're pretty sure that first Maccabees was written in Hebrew originally, but we don't have that. Now we only have it in Greek but it was written in, in, in Hebrew originally. So the, the first Maccabees is actually much more historical, but it's not an exhaustive history like the five volumes he's talking about. It's a very quick, short, to the point history. It just tells you the facts. It doesn't tell you much theology. Whereas second Maccabees is all about this reflection and theological reflection, especially um, about, you know, so, so where first Maccabees says, uh, Judas Maccabees won the victory, and Second Maccabees said God, in God's great mercy, brought to Judas the victory. Right? There's there's a slight difference there, um, and so we can see that already in the first reading. I don't think we have time to read the second reading, which is okay. That'll that'll get us great. Uh, it'll be a great start for us next week as we look at the history. The second reading is from First Maccabees, so we'll see the difference there. Um, we didn't look at these questions, but we kind of answered the first one. Why is it important for the Jews in Jerusalem to share their story with the Jews in Egypt? Because they're looking for unity in the midst of a time of diaspora. They're looking uh, to be connected with Jews everywhere and to keep Israel and the temple as the center of their faith, even when those Jews find themselves in a foreign country um, living somewhere else. Think that this study is really fabulous because I think about it in relationship to today. Yeah. Where Christianity has been hammered from every angle. And it, it seems that um, the hammer, he was the one that said, no, stop. You're not going to. But make us bow down to Baal and to, to Zeus and all of these right. pagan gods. We're not having it. Yeah. And it was just a little right type group mm -hmm. that really changed, I mean, really saved Judaism. And actually, you're probably right. Yeah. Because <laughs> they were. They had let them stay, like you said, they were ruling themselves, so to speak, but they were still under the big government. Yeah. And yet, um, this um, Epiphanes, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, yeah. Fourth came in there and said, No, you can rule yourself, but you want to worship the way we worship. Right. We're not going to let you do this anymore. I think they say Judaism. It's I, just, I think it's an incredible yeah. study. I think Oh, of course. I, I think you're probably right. Now, I will say, we're going to get into the story, 
And we're going to be looking at the Maccabees saying, yay, Maccabees. And then we're going to get to some parts where we're like, no, no, that, that is too far. And so Maccabees uh, has a very conflicted history. Uh, some of them, some people see them as heroes of the tradition, and some people see them as religious fanatics and zealots um, that went too far. And so part of our reflection on Maccabees is going to have to do with um, what do we see in them that's good and what do we see that's conflicting with, with what we believe to be true or, or our own Christian tradition, because we're not, you know, we're not totally in line with them. We'll see that. Um, but that, you know, your point gets to this third question, you know, are there examples of inner geographical storytelling today, or maybe not just inner geographical storytelling, but intercultural stories. And I think the immigrant story is definitely one of those stories um, that's, that's connected and relevant. We have some of these same themes of, of tradition versus kind of a new culture. Um, uh, and, you know, the Jewish story continues to be intergeographical, intercultural. Um, and there are other, there are other cultures and, you know, we can see that. So that might be an important question for us to think about as well. Um, where are the similarities between what they were facing and what we are experiencing? So today really was an introduction. We didn't get into the text that much. Next week and the rest of the series, we're going to spend much more time in the text itself, starting with uh, 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verse 1, next week. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. saying that when there's unrest in the world, that's infinite, that's and increase.